So how many people have trouble with priorities? I think I should see every hand in the room raise, right? <laughs> we all have problems with priorities. Today we're going to continue on this trek of, of stewardship. And for those of you who have <clears throat> been missing the past couple of weeks, which God knows I have no idea why, <laughs> right? I mean, just, just a little bit of snow, you know? But for those of you who are missing, we've gone through time, talent, and treasure. And if you've missed any one of those sermons, they're on YouTube. Go to our website, newmarketcc.org. Follow at the top of the page, follow the sermons link. You can watch all, whichever ones you missed. But we're going to start tying the big three T's together. We're going to start tying time, talent, and treasure all together. And we're going to continue to, to develop this over the next four weeks into this, this stewardship idea. You know, we're going to take it this week to priorities. Next week, we're going to talk about material possessions. The week after, we're going to talk about service. And we're going to round it all out in the entire sermon series by talking about whether you're a consumer or a contributor. But today, we're going to focus on priorities. And, and I had a, a, a late week scripture change. <sighs> One of these weeks, it's going to get in there, and it's not going to be able to be undone. <laughs> um, but flip with me, if you would, to First Timothy. We're going to, go to First Timothy chapter six, and we're going to read virtually the entire the entire chapter there. The whole thing is is extremely relevant. You know, this is one of the the epistles that we call the pastoral epistles. Um, looking for a mint in my pocket. Um, First and Second Timothy and Titus are, are what we call the pastoral epistles, meaning that Paul is addressing these um, these letters to these these guys, Timothy and Titus. They are, you know, Paul is this, for lack of a better way of describing, he's an area director. <laughs> you know, he's the apostle. Okay, and Timothy and Titus are are these these pastors. They are these these guys that go from church to church, developing and working with these churches to help them grow. And in this letter, Paul is addressing Timothy, and he's kind of rounding everything out in this letter. If you would, we're going to go to First Timothy six, and I'm going to start in uh, verse two b. Teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, with a teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing, but having a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slanders, evil suspicions, constant disagreement among men whose minds are depraved, and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now you, man of God, run from these things, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and have made a good confession before many witnesses in the presence of God who gives life to all and before Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom none of mankind has seen or can see, to whom be the honor and internal might. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God 
who richly provides us with all these things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the age to come, so that they may take hold of the life that is real. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent, empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that bear, falsely bears the name. By professing it, some people have deviated from the faith. Grace be with all of you. It's a long, long chapter, rounding out all kinds of stuff, but contained within these chapters, three separate times, Paul brings up Christ. Three separate times he talks about Christ and, and how important it is to have him as the priority over everything that we do. It's verses 3, verses 11 through 16, and then again in verse 17b. So the question of the day is this. Is Christ your priority in life? My bet is that everybody in this room will answer yes. We really don't think this is a problem for us. However, the actions speak a different story. Okay? Following verse 3, where he calls this first call to say that, that people teach doctrine that's other than what Jesus Christ teaches, other than what promotes godliness. Verses 4 and 6, he goes through this whole list of things of what these people who falsely teach do. They're conceited. They don't understand anything. They have a really sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. They become envy. They're quarrelsome. They're slanderers. Evil suspicions drive from this. And they're in constant disagreement among who, men whose minds are not only depraved, but deprived of the truth. But godliness with contentment, he says, is of great gain. If Christ is our true priority, if Christ is our true priority, as it says in verse 3, then we're going to look at verse 7 and 8 and say, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. We will be content with food and clothing. If Christ is our true priority... Wanting of things is not it. We all kind of want more. I have that problem myself. You know, we, we all kind of have this tendency to, to want more out of life. I thought marriage was more than this. I thought having children was more than this. I thought church was supposed to be more than this. So we all kind of want more because we're putting stock in the wrong things. Okay? You see, we pursue career, we pursue money, we pursue fame. My kid deserves to make it. They've put in so much hard work. You and every other kid out there, really, seriously. When every kid fills out this form, they, they what do you want to be when they grow up? I want to be a professional basketball player. I want to be a professional soccer player. You know how small of a percentage... That is, I mean, dreams are good, but reality is better. Okay? We focus on materials. We focus on houses, cars, <clears throat> technology. <clears throat> Te <clears throat> technology. <clears throat> For the young people in the room, I am convinced that technology will be the downfall of this society. You can mark my words. Technology will be the downfall of the society because why? We rely on it too much. I've started building up a, a stockpile of, of my books that I have on my Logos program on my computer because I, I was reminded this week, I was reminded this week of when my computer crashed <coughs> and I had no books to study with. I had everything I had stocked in that technology. And I was reminded one more time this week that I put way too much stock in technology. And it is going to come to a head. One day, technology will fail. It's only a matter of time because the, it, it's, it's all woven together. <laughs> it all relies on each other. 
We pursue these things that, that don't last. You see, in many families, children are the focus of the family. You see, they run ragged with going to soccer practices and dances and and um, baseball practices and softball. There, you know, we got 15 different things going on at once. When in actuality, it's not the kids that should be the priority, but God first, marriage second, and then the children. The children are a distant third. Not to say that you need to neglect your kids, but don't spoil them rotten. Take time to invest in your marriage. Take time to invest in things that really matter. Because as Jim said this morning, it's falling on us to educate our children in the ways of God because they're not getting it anywhere else. And most kids aren't even in church these days. So the only people that they're going to get it from is you. And let me keep in mind that most of your children's friends don't go to church either. So the only time your children's friends are going to get it is when they're with you. Make sure that you are a steward, a good prioritizer of your things. You see, we need to be focusing on God, but we do everything but focus on God. I want you to do an experiment. I want you to take each day. Sorry, my voice is kind of shaky the past couple of days, so bear with me. Take, it, take each day, I want you to do this for a week, okay? Take it each day and record a log. Make a recorded log of every hour, every minute, every second, every day, and find out how you're spending that. Log down. I had to do this. It was either for school. I was trying to remember this morning. It was either for school or it was for an, an actual job. I had to account for every minute of every day that I put in. I had to let them know what I was doing, where I was, how I was doing it. I had to account for every single minute of every day. I want you to do the same thing. Account for every minute that you spend. And then at the end of that week, add up the time and see where most of your time is going. My bet that everybody in this room, their first priority will not be God. Your first priority will be anything but God. That's bad. And that includes me too. Okay? It is a hard, hard reality that we face in our culture because our culture is really good at putting other things first, and we can't help but follow. Verses 9 and 10 say that the love of money is the root of all evil. You hear people say that money, money is just the root of all evil. Well, no, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not all evil, but all kinds of evil. You see, the point is this, is we can say that we love God, <laughs> but do your actions support that statement? Do your actions actually support what you say? Because let me remind you that love is not an emotion. Love is an action. If you say that you love your spouse, what do you do? You buy them cards, gifts, flowers, I'm really bad at all of these things. I am not thoughtful at all. Sherry will be the first one to tell you. I just, you know, you stop it and get, a, get her a coffee, and even when she asks, you still forget. <laughs> but you, you make these attempts to show them that you love them by these physical things, right? God's the same way. If you really love God, then your priority is going to be him. Your, everything that you do is going to be focused around him, even career, even the pursuit of, of money and you know, these things that our society says is important. Even that can be focused around God. Okay. <sighs> Careers, money, misplaced priorities have caused more people to fall away from God than anything else. Because as somebody who's been in the working world, I understand that you end up becoming a slave to your boss. The way it is. What they want out of you, you either do or you don't have a job. You end up becoming a slave to them. Okay? Here, Paul reiterates for a second time 
the importance of running away from evil and focusing on God here in verses 11 to 16. All this whole big spiel. Pursue godliness, faith, endurance, love, gentleness, part of the, the gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Make the good confession. And remember that God is King of kings, Lord of lords. Remember that He is first and foremost above all things in this world. And he goes on, he says, verse 17a, instruct those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant or set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth. If I took a survey of this room and asked you if you thought you were rich, I guarantee that nobody in this room would say that they are rich. <laughs> oh, I've got a rude awakening for you. It only takes $34,000 a year to be in the top richest 1% in the world. You make $34,000 a year, multiply that times if there's two people in your house, you are among the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the entire world. Ouch. The poorest 5% of Americans, people living on the street, basically, they are better off than two-thirds of the rest of the world. They are more financially stable than two-thirds of the rest of the world. Ouch. We have no excuse. There is no excuse. We are some of the richest people in the world, and yet we complain about wanting more. Really? You've already been blessed immensely above what you should have. Because we should be content, right here, verses 7 and 8, we should be content with mere food and, and clothing. But yet we gripe because our, our power went out. Or, you know, gas is six some odd dollars a gallon. There are some people that have to scrounge around in 30 below weather just to have enough firewood to keep themselves warm. We have no excuse. Verses 18 to 21 are reminders of, of what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. You see, instead of focusing on this wealth and, and wanting more, we should, in, uh, we, we should focus on God and, and He provides us with everything we need and, and we're supposed to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to, to have a, a good foundation for the age to come. Because what good is a blessing if you keep it to yourself? What good is a blessing if you keep it to yourself? These are the top five comments that I've heard in my ministry. I'm going to go through these five and I'll go back through each one of them. Number, five, number one, don't pack too many things into a week. Nobody will come. Over five years of ministry, I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that statement. Don't pack too many things into a week because ain't nobody going to come. Number two, it's better to do it all on Sunday. Nobody has time through the week. Really? Okay. Worship should only be an hour. You can't hold people's attention for longer than that. We want more youth and families. We've done our duty in the youth department. It's the next generation's turn. Let me go through these one by one. Don't pick too many things into a week. Nobody will come. Well, see, if we love God and he really is a priority, wouldn't you want to spend time in fellowship with him? Acts 2 church, go back and read it. Acts 2, these people lived it every single day of their lives. They lived, eat, and breathed God. And the Lord added to their number every single day. It wasn't just an hour on Sunday morning. They lived it every single day. It's better to do it all on Sunday. Nobody has the time through the week. Um, well, it's kind of the same problem. Does God, does God not really hold any weight through the week? Or is he just this Sunday morning God that you pull out of your pocket and say, oh, it's time to go to worship service. Oh, no. God is bigger than that. It's more than that. That is nothing but a surface Christianity. Worship should only be an hour. You can't hold people's attention longer than that. If the service can't hold your attention for the worship service for an hour, then we need to redo everything that we're doing. 
if I can't hold your attention for an hour, then we need to, we need to pep things up a little bit. We need to get something in here that's going to keep people awake. Because I've been to worship services that are two, three, four, five hours long. You don't even know the difference. If I can't hold your attention for an hour, then we need to be doing something different. Because worship is not, you know, just sitting here like a bump on a log. It's about dancing and, in in, you know, raising your hands. And I'm not trying to turn this into a Pentecostal church by any stretch of the imagination. But raise your hands in glory to the Lord for once. Give him the honor and glory. We should be excited that we are here worshiping God. If I can't hold your attention for an hour, then we've got some serious problems. Serious problems. We want more youth and families. I have heard this statement at every single church I have been at. But inherent in that statement is this quote. But we don't really want to do anything for it. We need more youth and families, but if we're going to do that, first of all, we have to show up at events. This is the biggest threat to this church. One of the biggest threats is the fact that the church does not come out and support the youth events. The block party, yes. Some of the other big events like that, yes. But nobody comes to youth group. Any of you know the outreach family activities that we do, Nobody comes. I have a handful of people that come every single time. We have, on average, 70 to 80 people in this church on a Sunday morning. What is going on the rest of the week that you can't make it? <clears throat> Oops. Yeah. So one of two things are going to start to happen. You're either going to really start to not like me, or you're going to realize that God is calling us to a deeper commitment than just on Sunday mornings. It's what it's about, folks. We've done our duty in the youth department. It's the next generation's turn. I would agree with that statement. I would agree with that statement. However, if there's no one to do the work in the youth department, then guess what? <laughs> it ain't going to get done. I've got a handful of people that are on the youth team. Since I've been here, we've asked for Sunday school teachers in all of the rounds Sooner or later, our young people are going to get the idea that either we don't care or they're going to start to copy our behavior. Okay? If we want more youth and families, we have got to invest time and attention because I tell you what, you can throw money at a kid, you can throw things at a kid, but look at the, some of the richest people in this country and what they do when they throw their money at the kids. What do the kids want? They want nothing but time and attention, do they? It's all they want. All sometimes a kid needs is just for you to show up and say, Hi, my name is, what can I do to be praying for you today? Show them time and attention. You see, it's about priorities. Every single one of these statements, and there are tons of these that go along with this. I'm not talking about this church. And, you know, I, I put these up on YouTube and all kinds of people listening to them. The world is the one that needs to hear these. They need to hear this stuff. They need to hear the comments of people. You know, these are people, reasons why people don't come into churches. Because the priorities are not in the right place. Haggai is a great Old Testament book of prophecy. And it was in Israel, you know, they were coming back from Babylonian captivity and they were busy setting themselves up. And they forgot God. And it's a picture of judgment. So the point is, is if we're going to give God the lip service of priority, then our actions had better show that we do indeed have God as a priority. Either he is or he isn't. You can say it all you want, but your actions will determine whether or not that statement is true. Okay? You see, we've got a, a crisis already been brewing in this church. I've been here almost a year, and the one thing that I see that is going to kill this church more than anything is the leadership. We have got a great leadership, but 90% of my board and my elders are over the age of 70. That is a serious problem. That is a very, very serious problem. 
because it takes a minimum of two to five years to disciple someone new into taking that position. Over the next five to 10 to 15 years, I will be doing more funerals than I will be marriages. And that scares the living. That scares me. That really, really worries me because that's a crisis that has to be averted now. We, we can't delay in bringing young people to the church. We can't delay in doing everything we can because we've got 129 going on 130 years worth of history here that is not going to get passed on if we don't get young people in here to take the reins of the church. What do we need to do? Well, here's your list. Number one, we need to start at home. You need to have family devotional time and a daily Bible reading plan. These are some of the goals that Sherry and I have made recently. That's why I'm <laughs> spouting. A lot of this is where this has come from. That's something that Sherry and I don't do very well at all. We don't have family devotional time or a daily read Bible reading plan. It's terrible. I'm the preacher and it doesn't happen. <laughs> you know. So as I sit here and say this to you, again, rem I, I remind you, I've said this time and time again, but as I point to you, I am also pointing to me. Because this stuff is a problem with me, too. It isn't just everybody else sitting in this room. It isn't even the people sitting outside of this room. It's all of us. Number two, we need to educate our kids on biblical matters that the world contradicts. Money is a really good one. We need to teach our kids that when they go to school not to incur debt. Lord knows I've got $117,000 worth of debt that I've got to pay off. I've said that over and over again. Yeah, and... and and, and you know what the scary part is? I've got it pretty easy. There's a lot of people that have way more debt than I do. I've seen upwards of $250,000 in school loan debt. No debt is good. We need to education, educate our kids on creation. You know, watch the Ken Ham and Bill Nye debate this past week. And a lot of people have the idea of what Bill Nye does. Doesn't matter how much we pull scripture out, he still goes, well, what about this? Well, God's word is the authority, and a lot of people don't believe that. We need to have more than a, a Sunday devotion to God by being at activities, not just at church, but, but volunteering at various places in the community, showing people that we really do care. You know, I'm not trying to pump up the church, but a lot of the good activities that we've got going on here to reach people, we can... If we want the outside to come into the church, you know, I'm going to take the movie night just for example. You know, this month in February, we've got a really good turnout. We've got about 12 couples coming. But last month, we had 10, 12 people. And even if I were to bring 50 people from the outside into that church, there's nobody, there's, there's just a handful of people from the church that were there. How is the outside supposed to know that we care if we're not there to show them that we care? They're going to get the idea that we don't. We have to be there for these things in order to show these people. I, I can't stress that enough. We can't save people if we're not putting time into it. It's going to take effort. You know, I, I, God knows I know this congregation is getting older, but I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm as stumped as everybody else is. We need to let go of all the worldly comforts that drag us away from Christ. And that means everything from career to money to romance to movies to TV to games. I quit a job on the spot because it, they wanted... <laughs> I was working for Holiday Inn in St. Louis. Sherry was... I don't remember. Sherry was somewhere. I was, with, I was by myself with Ave. Hannah hadn't been born yet. Ave was maybe one and a half, two years old. And I was the food and beverage director of this hotel. And it was my job when somebody called in to cover that shift. I had to fi either find somebody to do it or I had to go in and do it. I knew this going in. But I had a guy call off. I didn't have anybody to cover that shift. Nobody I called was available to work that shift. So it was left to me. And I called the boss and I said, I can't come in. I've got my daughter. She's a year and a half old. I, I cannot come in and work this shift. Well, you, you either come in and work this shift or, you know, you're not going to have a job. And I said, well, what am I going to do? I said, I'm not bringing my child to work with me. 
put her in a pack and play. Put her on the end of the uh, on the end of the, the line and you know with the line with the cooking where they do all the cooking. Put her on the end of the line and in a pack and play. You know, we're plenty of people here. We'll keep her busy. And I'm like, I am not going to stick my one and a half year old daughter at the end of a hot kitchen line where something could possibly happen. I said, I quit. If you're going to try and make me do this, I quit right here and now. And I did it. I'm right there on the spot. Now, a day later, she called me and you know, we had a talk and I went back for two or three months while they found somebody else. But I am not going to let a job dictate my family or my, my, my faith because at this time I was beginning to come back to Christ. I'm not afraid to leave a job because they didn't line up with what my beliefs were. You know, I, I'm not going to let the world dictate my, my faith. I'm just not going to do it. And, and the point is, is that we need to be ready and willing to get rid of anything that is going to interfere with that. That's the only reason I told that story. You have got to be really ready and willing to get rid of anything that will interfere with that. The idea is that we need to show community that Christ is a priority by physically supporting the church, not just in giving. We are a giving church. Okay, when we ask for donations, oh my gosh, you people come out of the woodwork to donate stuff. But more times than not, it's not just the stuff that we need, but we need your physical presence. Even if you do nothing but sit at a table and talk. That's all we need. It's all we ask for is just your presence. Okay, make Christ the priority. It's what it really means to have Christ as your Lord and Savior. We are, our 90% of Christians are really good at, you know, Christ is our Lord, and, you know, he, he is our Savior, because He's the only one to which we can have even the hope of salvation for. But sometimes, most of us, including me, have a problem with making Him the Lord of our life. It is a daily battle. You know, we kind of get this idea that sometimes we don't think this applies to me. But when in reality, it really does. Because, you know, Sherry will be, you know, correcting me on something. You know, well, you really exploded at the kids. You know, you, no, I didn't. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're doing it right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, here's the thing. Even though we think that something may not apply to us, it, that's usually when it does. Okay? Yes, it does. So are your priorities really where you say they are? Do your actions line up with your words? I want to encourage you to make Christ your Lord and Savior in word and deed. I want to encourage you with this. Ain't nobody ever going to have it perfect. Nobody's ever going to have it perfect. We're not going to be good enough. We're not ever going to have Christ right where he needs to be now, you know, 99%, 100% of the time. It's just not possible. That's why we need to call upon him. I have to remind myself on a daily basis that I have got to rely on him. Because it is by his blood that I even have the hope of accomplishing anything good. It is all because of him. Remember that. When you think you don't have enough strength to go on, pray for strength, and God will give you just a little bit to keep going on. And He'll keep giving you a little bit more, and a little bit more to just keep barely going on so that you continually rely on Him. It's the invitation time. You got that little nerve-wracking feeling you know, down in the pit of your stomach going on? I know I get that all the time. Is God speaking to you? Is God convicting you of something? Come forward for prayer. Lord knows we all need it. Priorities are not humanity's strong suit. Priorities are not our strong suit. Come forward. Let us pray together for one another. <laughs> Let us encourage one another that we're all in the same boat together. If there's anything else in the sermon you get from that, that's it. We're all in the same boat. Let us stand and, and sing a, a hymn of invitation. We're going to sing Circle of Friends and
if you've never given your life to Christ before, I want to encourage you to do that today because you'll be among a circle of friends that this world just can't give you.